Thanks for taking the time to watch or listen into this message from the Roots Community Church. Our prayer is always that God will use it to draw you closer to himself and deepen your love for Jesus Christ. And if you're new here, consider subscribing to keep up with all of our great content. Thanks again for checking out this message. We pray it's a blessing to you. called Romans, and it's simply that. We're going through the book of Romans, or the letter written to the church in Rome from the Apostle Paul, and if this is foreign to you or new for you, maybe you uh, kind of come up in a church that primarily does topical teaching, and there's lots of value in topical teaching. We'll do that here from time to time, but primarily, we go through books of the Bible, and the reason is, I think it's important, our, our leadership team thinks it's important, that we continue to learn from the full counsel of God's Word. Because what we can all have a tendency to do is cherry pick things we like and push other things to the side. And this maybe sometimes makes for a difficult text that we're working through on any given week. But it helps us to understand that all of God's word is God breathed and is alive and is active and it trains and equips us for what he has for us to do. And so we are in Romans chapter 4 today. Um, the entire thing. All of Romans 4 today, so it's a, it's a little bit of a hefty amount of text to read through. Uh, I think it's going to benefit us a lot. But let me give you a quick context before I read it to us this morning. The Apostle Paul has never been to the church in Rome, so he writes this letter. And about three years later, he will get to visit them. But right now, he sends them this letter, and he tells them, I want to come see you. This is who I am. This is the gospel that I preach. And then lays out for a couple of chapters, you need the gospel. You need Jesus. You need saving. And he will not let anyone wiggle around the fact that every single person needs Jesus and what he has accomplished on their behalf. That all of us fall short of his glory because of sin. That all of us have rebelled. All of us have been, have been piling up wrath on ourselves for the day of judgment. And that the only way for us to be good with God is for us to put our faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he has received the wrath for our sins on himself and extends righteousness to us. And it's not by works that we receive it, but by faith that we're saved. And so we just ended last week with this great explanation of the gospel in the end of Romans chapter 3 um, that Paul gave us. And one of the key verses that I love and that we need to understand is, in verse 28, it says, For we maintain that a person is justified, that's declared righteous, by faith, apart from the works of the law. So today he's going to continue on that point, and I'm going to read the text first before I start preaching it on accident. So uh, here we go. It's a lot of verses. Bear with me. I'm doing the hard part. For what? That's not even what it says. It doesn't even say four. Let's start over again. <laughs> What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However... To the one who does not work but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith 
that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. You still with me? Two of you agree that you're still with me. The rest of you just laughed at me like we're not with you. Uh, It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, just as, 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 huh, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, He faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Still there? Listen, I know it's a lot, but I, I believe that God has a lot to say through it to us today, and we'll break it down in bite-sized chunks as we work through it this morning. I want to point a couple things out before I even jump into the text. This is a cool thing that we're going to see here today. Uh, Sometimes when we read the Bible, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we can feel like it's kind of disjointed. We can feel like they're kind of unhinged or unconnected because it looks like when you read the Bible sometimes that the Old Testament you work through seems to be a lot of God's wrath, and you better obey. That's how you're good with God. And then the New Testament seems to be grace and faith, and, and, and God just seems happier and so sometimes can, people can think like God shifted, God changed, something happened that, that all of a sudden it doesn't almost seem like the same God in Scripture. And so Paul is going to do an amazing work today to help all of us understand. First off, read the New Testament and you'll realize the New Testament talks about wrath a lot, just like the Old Testament does. And what he's going to do is point back to the Old Testament to say this idea of us being declared righteous in God's sight by faith apart from works has actually been there from the get-go. That it's all one continuous story and that God has not changed. That it's always been about your faith in him that has made you right with him. Which is helpful for us to understand because I think too often it can be looked at or viewed upon like, oh, the, the Old Testament isn't, isn't the God I want to follow. It's the same God. <laughs> and we need to understand that all the way through and through. And so what Paul is about to do, he already told us that we're justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And now he's going to do this, this amazing thing in this debate. See, he's going to bring two witnesses to his account. And in the court of law, at two witnesses, it was considered truth. That was enough for someone to be found guilty or innocent, the the eyewitness account of of two witnesses. And so what Paul does to the people he's speaking to, the Gentile and the Jew, he goes back to the two foremost looked after and and, and, uh, kind of spoken about people in their history. The forefather of their faith and their greatest king. He says, this isn't just an idea I came up with. Why don't you look down your own family line and look to the king that you always talk about and want to have somebody like again? Paul wants them to understand this is who God has always been. It's what he's always been about. And now we see it fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So let's go. If you're taking notes, write this down for the message today. What does scripture say? It's a good question to ask. 
And then for the first point, right, your forefather discovered it. Check this out. Paul starts to bring forth his first witness and explain that he's not alone in his understanding of being justified or declared righteous by faith. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? What did he discover about being justified? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. I want them to understand that, that, listen, if you read the story, they know the story of their forefather, Abraham. If you've read the story of Abraham, he is far from perfect. If it's just on account, if his righteousness is dependent on how well he was perfect, he's in trouble just from what we know. He has nothing to boast about before God. And then I love this. What does Scripture say? That phrase, those four words, should be a phrase used all the time by believers. When we wonder about topics in our own lives or in the culture, what should I do or or how should I decide this, our question should always be, what does Scripture say? Not to what does a friend say, not can I find somebody that will justify my behavior, but what does Scripture say? Now, let me just bring a little more to that, too. It's not just what does a Scripture say. It's what does Scripture say? Because what we have a tendency to do, and we can do with the Bible, because it, is, it has power in it, is we can pull out a cherry-picked verse and try to make it, contort it, bend it, so that we feel good about what we're about to do. And we can say, well, God said I could. But we had to take it out of the text to make it say that. Let me just tell you something. When it says, what does Scripture say? Go ahead and find the verse that has the topic about what you're talking about. And then read the verse before it. Read the verse after it. Read the whole paragraph. Read the letter or the gospel or the narrative that it's found in. And then read the whole Bible. Because the best way to interpret Scripture is Scripture. And so understanding the context of the verse is key so that we don't get duped or have someone pull something out of context. We have a tendency to do it ourselves. We need to understand what does Scripture really say about what I'm working through, maybe what someone else has brought to me as an idea, what the culture says. What does Scripture say? So we'll go on. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Not Abraham did a bunch of things, but Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. If you're taking notes, right, let's check your credit. Let's check your credit. It was credited to him. It was it was given to him. It was reckoned to him. It was accounted to him as righteousness. It goes on in verse 4 and says, Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. If it was about works, then salvation would just be God being obligated to pay us for what we had done. But in Romans chapter 6, which I'm, I'm really trying in this series not to preach out of Romans further on in the book because I don't want to over-preach things that I'm not to yet and then get there and just be like, I already told you guys four times. <laughs> but in Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the, here's the idea, that if the wages for what you have done, the payback for your actions, the works that you have accomplished. If you were to get paid for those, you are a sinner, and that wage is death. It's not salvation or righteousness. And the understanding that eternal life, that righteousness before God, is a gift given through Jesus Christ our Lord. Can we go back to the Romans 4 text? Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. This is so awesome. To the one who does not work, 
doesn't mean the lazy bum. It means the one that doesn't rely on their works as if God has to pay them back with being right with him. Thinking that in their own works they can attain a rightness with God. Be careful. We can all have a tendency to try to play that vicious cyclical game of works. However, to the one who does not work but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, declares righteous the ungodly, that's the part where you go like, praise God, because every single one of us needs that. Their faith is credited as righteousness. Let's keep moving. we got a lot of texts to get through. He goes to his next witness, and I just wrote down, your king says the same thing. Check this out. David says the same thing. When he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. And he'll reference Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2, and say, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Forgiven, covered, never counted against them. How awesome is that? What a blessing is that? And he doesn't say, blessed is the one who works enough for God to finally have them be right with him. He says, no, the one that is blessed is the one that God forgives. God's the one that does the initiating and all of the work to make it happen. He's forgiven, he's covered, and it's taken away. It's not counted against them. The only way for that to be done is for God to do that on our behalf. So he, he goes to these witnesses to say, hey, this isn't, this is, Maybe you feel like a rough idea for you to get your hands around because you've only been doing works and trying to feel right with God because of what you have done. But you need to understand that those that are the forefathers in the faith, those you look up to because of their faith, they believe the same thing I'm saying. That their belief in God is what made them righteous. Not their ability and their own strength to do a couple of things on a list. King says the same thing, and write this down. The value of a sign is what it signifies, not in the sign itself. The value of a sign is what it signifies, not in the sign itself. We can have a tendency to put more value in the sign than what the sign means. So he's going to go after circumcision here and talk about that it's a sign and it's a seal. It was one of the things that kind of verified what had happened. It, it, it's, a, it's a sign, but it, what it signifies is a covenant made by God to a people for salvation. It's a sign, but this, don't get caught up in the sign. You don't get caught. They're caught up in saying like, well, oh, yeah, but we're circumcised. We've done this thing. We have this thing, so we should be good. So, so first, they're going like, well, we have our forefathers, Abraham. And, and he goes like, well, it's not just having Abraham. It's about having belief. And now he'll say it's not just about a sign that you have. It's what the sign signifies. What does it point to? Let's look at the text. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? What he's saying is, is it only for the Jew or also for the Gentile? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. If you want to know where to find that, Genesis 15, Genesis 17. Cool. And he received circumcision as a sign a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. He didn't have righteousness by the sign or by the seal. He had it by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Now I need you to understand this because we do some things that are good things. They're just not saving things. So today we're, we're going to do baptism and we should cheer and we should be excited as people are ready to proclaim with action their faith in Jesus that their heart has been transformed, regenerated, that they went from a hard, dead heart to an alive, fleshy heart. They're a new creation in Christ Jesus and they're ready to say it to the world that they are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's exciting. 
But just getting in water and getting dunked doesn't save somebody. It's a sign or a seal of what has already been done by faith. And so it's right that we do the things that Scripture says it looks like to be a Christian. Like we should serve. We should give. We should get baptized. It's in accordance to obedience to God's word because we love him, not because we think it will make us right with him and righteous. We are not justified by how much we give, by how much we serve, by how many times we got dunked, but by faith. And I have a great concern. Raising our, our sons in church is the right thing. I want to teach them the right things, but sometimes when you're raised in church, you can learn the things and lack the faith. And so maybe even as an adult, you can look back and see the track record and think you're good with God because of the things. You're not. Well, I've been to the Sunday school. I got this. I got that. I've been baptized. I've been, I have this memorized. I've... You're not justified by that. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ that you are made righteous. And that should be freeing and exciting. And it doesn't mean throw out all the stuff you did. It was probably great stuff. But now let's move forward in a place of not trying to earn something or think we're good because of something, but of knowing that we're good because of the finished work of Jesus. I didn't finish my verses. Where was I? So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So he's saying, listen, you don't have a monopoly on Abraham because he's the father of all of those that believe and are justified. It is not just for the Jew, it's for the Gentile, and he's the father of many nations as he was promised in Genesis. It wasn't just that he'd be a father of this great nation, although he was of Israel, but he also is of great nations for those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Awesome. That's the last of that verse. The promise comes by faith, not through the law. I know I've said it a lot already, but I want you to catch this. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise, which is good because the law, the Mosaic law, didn't come for like 500 years after Abraham. So it clearly can't be through that that they received the promise. It's good for us to understand that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgression. And transgression here is an interesting word um, because it is sin, but it happens to be a little bit greater than that. What it is, is an understanding of a command and then clear denial of it or clear disobedience to it. How many know it's already wrong to do something that's wrong, but it's even more wrong if you know it's wrong to do? So he's trying to drive home the point, like, now that you have the law, that's great that you have the law. And it makes you, like, extra guilty. <laughs> and that wrath comes because of the law. And the promise doesn't come through that law. It comes by faith. Watch this. Therefore, the promise comes by faith. So that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. That's everybody that puts their faith in Jesus. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. I love that it's guaranteed through grace. By faith. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom he believed. This is cool. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. That's a cool line. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. This is an idea of resurrection and creation. That God, I love this, I, I, this quote from a guy named John Stott. 
on this verse. He said, nothingness and death are no problem for God. Think about that for a second. Nothingness and death are no problem for God. Because he gives life to things that are dead. And he calls into being things that were not. The God we believe in, we put our faith in, that we pray to, that, that should shift some of our prayer life. The God we pray to has no limit. But oftentimes our prayers are, are limited. As if God has a difficulty with the size of our problems. And I love that Abraham has this belief, and Paul is nailing it down, the God who gives life to the dead, he, he can bring things back to life and call things to be that are not. It's an amazing thing to understand the promises of God and that he is faithful to them and has the ability to fulfill them. Write this down. Face the facts and walk in faith. Face the facts and walk in faith. Let me tell you something. Oftentimes when we're going through something and we're trying to have faith in it, God will pull us through. God will show up in some sort of way. People will give us advice on one of these two. And it usually is to push away the other one. So if someone tells me when I say, man, this is the bad thing I'm going through, but this is what I'm believing God for, and they say face the facts, Usually what they mean by that is, hey, quit having that big faith and just deal with the reality of where you're at. Cut out that faith in God part and quit being naive. Like, this is where you are. On the flip side, a lot of other people, if I have these facts and I'm, I'm trying to wrestle through the faith piece, if they say, well, just walk by faith, there's some people that when they say that, they mean pretend like the facts aren't real. Like, just if you would just walk by faith, you wouldn't even deal with the fact that these are facts. <laughs> but what we're going to see is the beauty of Abraham dealing with both. That he had the ability to face the facts and walk by faith. Sometimes when we talk about faith and talking uh, and following and walking in faith, we, we speak of it as if it's blind. Because of verses like walk by faith and not by sight. And often faith can be seen as more of like a mysticism than it is of what the Bible speaks of. There is a substance to our faith. There is a person that our faith is in. It is not just, just faith in, in whatever. That would be mysticism. But we believe in God fulfilling his promises. We believe our faith is in the character of God. Are you hearing me right now? We need to learn to, it's, we don't have to be afraid to face the facts. We need to know the facts. And walk by faith. Watch what happens here. I love this line. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. So all the odds are against him, and he's like, I still have hope. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. Listen, God promised him to be the father of many nations, and he doesn't have... The child to make that happen. And he has to face the fact, he faces the fact, like, wait a second, I'm as good as dead. And so is my wife's womb. Listen, he's double dead. Double dead, like any, either one of these, if one of them had the ability on their own to feel like they could reproduce by themselves, then you might go like, oh man, it's still impossible because one of you is dead. And if that wasn't enough, he's double dead. Against all hope in hope, he believed. And his faith wasn't weakened. 
Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding, listen, the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith. Wait a second. He's double dead. And instead of that, weakening his faith, he strengthened his faith. In the promises of God and gave God glory or gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That's the key. The faith, the reason the faith could be strong even though the outlook was bad, because his faith wasn't in the outlook. His faith wasn't in a people. It wasn't in stuff. It wasn't in things. His faith was in the the. Faithful God. His faith was in the God who made the promise, having the power to come through on his promise. And so instead of his faith weakening, despite the outlook and the situation, the double death, he believes life is coming forth because the one who made the promise is the creator of the universe. He brings dead things to life and can call things to be even though they weren't. I hope you're hearing me. This is the forefather of our faith. This is the example for us to look to and what it means to have faith for God to fulfill. And we have a greater thing to look to. He was looking forward to Jesus. We know Jesus died on the cross and has been resurrected. Being fully persuaded. That God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. He was declared righteous. He was, it was credited to him as righteousness. Because of his faith in the one who made the promise. Because of his faith in the one that had the power to accomplish what he said he would accomplish. And for us, we can look to the finished work of Jesus Christ to understand the power of God for salvation for all of those that put their faith in Jesus. We have the fulfillment of the promise that he looked forward to. Look at this as far as an example of Abraham's faith. Just for a moment, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8 through 12 says this, By faith... Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundation, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because, check this out, because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. And if we skip down a few verses in Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham's belief in the fact that God could could and does always accomplish what he promises to accomplish allowed him to walk in a faith that would bring his son up on a mountain to sacrifice, even though that through him would be the promise fulfilled, allowed him to believe that even though he was dead, she her womb was dead, they were double dead, he believed that life would show up on the scene. Like, He walked every day in faith. And did he nail it all the time? No, read your Bible. He didn't. But he's credited as righteous. Not because of his perfection. But because of his belief 
in the power and promises of God. And it's also for us by faith. I better have Jordan come up here and strum on this guitar. The last few verses of Romans chapter 4. You guys are doing a great job staying with me for this full chapter. It says, the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. That the promise that was looked forward to in salvation and righteousness being available and credited, Abraham looked forward to the day. We look back knowing that it's been accomplished in Jesus Christ. He has died for our sins on the cross. He has resurrected, raised from the grave on the third day. That we would be forgiven of sins and declared righteous, credited righteousness. That we are in right standing with God, free from our sin and its consequences. That we would move forward in a life to glorify him with everything that we have, not because we feel like we need to do the right things, accomplish the right things, finish the right tasks, come from the right family, go to the right church, but we are saved, set free, made right because of our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord. Somebody needs to breathe easy in here. Because you've been wrestling and you've been fighting and you've been doing your due diligence because you don't feel good enough with God based on your efforts and your works. Let me just free you up. You're not good enough. The wages for our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Be set free. That cycling of working as hard as you can to feel good and then feeling miserable because you messed up and then working as hard as you can to feel like you're good with God and then feeling like I'm not good with God, feel like I'm good with God, feel like I'm not. There's only one way to be good with God. It's through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, out of there do we work? We work like crazy, but we work with a different motivation. Not trying to be made right with God. We work because we are right with God. So what else would I do with my life than to pour it out for his glory and the benefit of others? I love this in Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Before I read it. The rest of chapter 11 is just, many call it the hall of faith. It says, by faith, this person did this. 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 They did these amazing things because they believed in the one who made the promise. They believed in the one that told them to do it. So they moved forward in that kind of way. And it says, and it goes on and says, and by faith, and it says all these people's names and says, I can't even tell you about all of them because I don't have time. Basically, it's telling you, read the Old Testament, you'll know. And then it goes on and says, and by faith, the mouths of lions were shut. And by faith, the fiery darts were, were stopped. And by faith, it's awesome, like, by faith, these amazing things happen. And then it says, and by the same faith, some were sawn in half. Hold on a second. And it goes on to say that, that, that by, like basically what it's saying is that by faith, some got in the lion's den and the, the mouths of the lions were shut. And by faith, some were tossed in the lion's den and were eaten by lions. And that both are honorable. 
because they lived by faith. That it wasn't the outcome of the thing that they did that was necessarily what to look for to see if they were honorable or not. It was did they walk in faith, believing in the promises of God, believing in the power of God and looking forward to him accomplishing everything he said he would accomplish. What it does is it gives us an eternal mindset instead of a temporary mindset. That you continue to push forward and to move forward despite what comes against you because you believe that God eventually comes back and judges and makes things right. And that you get to live eternally with him. Let's go back to Hebrews 12 now. At the end of Hebrews 11, after it says that some people had great things happen by faith, some got cut in half by faith. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It's just like, listen, keep walking by faith. Keep, keep moving by faith. There's a righteousness that God has revealed through the gospel. And those that are righteous, they live by faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, running this race out, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, the author and perfecter of faith. We look to Jesus. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That we move forward running this race that God has laid out for us. And we do it in faith every day. Tomorrow, by faith. Next minute, by faith. Next decision, by faith. And sometimes we have to face the facts and walk in faith. Yep. Sometimes we have to look and go like, wow, I'm dead. I'm double dead. But I believe in God. And I believe that he will see all of this through until it is all accomplished as he says it will be. He is faithful. He is powerful. It is done. And then I make my move. And then I make that decision in a way that honors him. Can you stand to your feet?